um, and uh, we're delighted to continue them here in the new uh, building. We're going to try to end promptly uh, at one o'clock, so let me uh, uh, quickly uh, introduce our speaker, uh, who is uh, retired Colonel uh, uh, Rick Welch, who was a U.S. Uh, Army officer, obviously with uh, uh, service. I was going to say I don't actually see our speaker, but there he is. Uh, <laughs> with uh, service in Iraq, uh, so that makes him near and dear to my heart for that reason. Um, although I will not hold him responsible for the things that went wrong. He uh, also is uh, uh, my uh, PhD student along with uh, Professor uh, David Williams, who is uh, here. And I'm pleased to see him here as well. Uh, Rick was um, uh, an expert in, uh, he, he was a Green Beret, which I, right? Is that right? Which I think means he used to jump out of perfectly good airplanes. <laughs> um, and his uh, military skills included counterinsurgency, unconventional, irregular, and asymmetric warfare, special reconnaissance, counterterrorism, psychological operations, and sensitive operations and intelligence. I don't know that he can get into all of those details today. Um, but uh, he is also a fellow lawyer um, uh, and a reco fellow recovering lawyer. Um, and uh, I am delighted to uh, welcome you all and to welcome him uh, to talk to us about his experiences in, uh, among other things, attempting to uh, uh, engage in reconciliation in Iraq. Please welcome Rick Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, and I, I told him last night I, I, he's forgotten more about Iraq, Iraq than I will ever know. But uh, uh, I, I want to thank you all for coming and taking some time out of your schedule. Uh, before we go, we have a listserv, a, a sheet here. So if you're not on the Center for the Study of the Middle East listserv and you would like to get regular information, then sign that list. You might even pass it around if you want now or just sign it before you leave. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you today and share uh, something about my experience in Iraq, which uh, was a little unusual. I had two tours, uh, but one tour was uh, right under right at two years, and then the next tour was five years. So it was a little different than the cadets uh, that are here are probably going to experience. But uh, it was a strange one, but I want to share that experience with you. And I have to give my disclaimers. and. and I guess I'm blocking the screen here a little bit, but uh, you know I'm not speaking officially for anyone here, for the U.S. government or for Indiana University, for the Center for the Study of the Middle East, or anything. I'm, I'm sharing my personal experience uh, that, that uh, in Iraq, I have my opinions uh, on a host of things, but the lecture is not about any of these things. You know, the decision to go to war in Iraq, or uh, what we did after we went there, how we conducted the war, uh, or the uh, uh, or the decision to pull out of Iraq, those are each separate topics that could take up a lot of time discussing. So I, I have my opinions, but the, the purpose of this uh, presentation is not to, not to, to go into those. Uh, what it does uh, talk about is my experience as a civil, first as a civil military advisor to uh, the commanding general of the largest heaviest combat division in our arsenal of the U.S. Army, the 1st Cavalry Division. And uh, I was uh, had a good desk job at the Pentagon, and until September 1, 2001, everyone thought that that was a safe place to be. Uh, but it, it turns out it, it sort of changed everyone's life. It certainly changed mine, because uh, uh, although I escaped uh, getting pulled back on active duty for a couple of years, in, in September of 2003, I got a call from my branch manager, and said, he said, I've got three assignments for you, you're going to get one of them. And uh, I ended up with the civil military advisor for the 1st Cavalry, and it was, it was a great experience. So I want to share two periods of time with you, the period from 2003 to 2005, and that time period with the 1st Cavalry Division as a civil military advisor, and then jump forward to 2007 to 2011 when I was brought back to Iraq and ended up uh, running the Reconciliation Center and program out of, out of Baghdad for, uh, uh, for those five years. Uh, if you have any questions, I, I'm okay with that. Uh, I've got someone keeping me on track on time. If you have to leave, I understand that. If I, if, if I use a military acronym, you know, it's, it's, I'm sort of slipping that default mode and you don't understand it, stop me and ask me to define that because 
the Army would not operate without acronyms. Uh, so this first period is 2003-2005. This is June 28, 2004, which is when we transferred sovereignty back to the uh, Iraqi people. Uh, two days before it was supposed to be because we thought there was going to be, uh, you know, an attack on the 30th, so they surprised everyone and did two days early. This was at the famous Cross the Sabres down by Adnan Palace in Baghdad where everyone gets a photograph. This is my personal security team that kept me alive for uh, about 13 months. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to share those guys with you. Uh, for the cadets in the room and, and those of you that have been in the military, you find yourself going to war as you are. You know, we never are quite ready for the next war. We're always thinking about the last war and, and prepared for the last one, but not necessarily the next one. These, uh, there's another vehicle, not in the picture because it was in the shop, but it looks just like those. Those were the vehicles that uh, I did my first 100 missions in Iraq in. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we went every nook and cranny of Baghdad province uh, during, through all the fighting. Uh, somehow we miraculously made it out without any injuries or, or, or casualties. But uh, I show you that for two reasons. One is, we didn't have enough armor to go on to all of the vehicles. Uh, all of the armor that we had went out to the brigade combat teams that were actually going to be the, 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 the fingers uh, out into the province and the city. And secondly, there was sort of a feeling that we weren't going to need armor, <laughs> you know, that, uh, that things were going to be okay. Remember those assumptions that everyone was going to cheer us and, and, uh, and everything would be okay? Uh, sweets and flowers. Uh, there, there you go. It was the contingency plan. Exactly. We did it with sweets and flowers. And they did that for about five minutes, and then that turned to bullets. Uh, and uh, so what happened was, uh, you know, when I used to go through Baghdad in these vehicles, uh, the people responded to you well. I mean, if you really had a personal relationship with people, uh, you didn't seem as threatening uh, in that environment to, to the good guys. Uh, and uh, and the enemy understood that, and so they forced us to what we call button up. And so with the the roadside bombs that were really artillery shells that were improvised to become you know huge bombs just like artillery, with the improvised explosive devices later the uh, uh, the uh, uh, enhanced force projectiles EFPs that were manufactured in Iran sent to Iraq through, uh, uh, through militias, uh, it forced us to button up an armor. And so then suddenly we became these impersonal machines running through the streets of Baghdad. People couldn't see the soldiers except the soldier in the turret, and, uh, and it was an unfriendly picture. So the enemy knew that. They forced us to button up, and it sort of changed the dynamic. Uh, so if you're the commander of the 1st Cavalry Division, the heaviest combat division, the, the leading <coughs> combat division in our arsenal, and your, you know, he was first on tap to go in on the invasion. And then the 1st Cavalry Division was pulled off and the 1st Armored Division took, took that role. And he was given a new mission, and that was prepare for stability and support operations. So what do you do when you're the commanding general? You, you, you know, you're used to tanks leading, using maximum firepower and force and maneuver and standoff distance with your weapons to, to you know, kill your enemy before they can kill you. What do you do when they're going to send that conventional force into an unconventional environment, uh, an irregular, asymmetric environment where you're putting the division right down in the middle of the enemy, not a linear battle like we're normally used to fighting? Well, the first thing you have to do is do your, what we call, mission analysis. You have to look it over and say, what do I do now? How do I, how do I, tr the soldiers who have been trained to let go with force in a precise way, how do I now train them to hold back uh, when they go into this environment? And uh, so you, you have to go through this uh, uh, mission analysis. You have to try to dull the tip of your spear, as I said. Uh, and how are you going to do that and survive in Iraq? And we, you know, I, I, I was given the task uh, under this, as a civil military advisor to oversee how we prepare this conventional army to go into an unconventional environment. Uh, and that was really uh, sucked all the oxygen out of my life uh, for quite a number of years because we said Iraq was a VUCA environment. It, you know, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that was a good description of the environment we found ourselves in. So General Pete Corelli, who later became the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, he was the commander of the division, 
had this philosophy that says if you if we win the people we cannot lose this effort but if we lose the people we can't possibly win and that was what he drove down through the leadership to the lowest level was this is about the people of Iraq uh, making it try to make it safe for them try to make the quality of their life better and if we can make the quality of life and make it safer maybe they'll want to hold on to that and support some sort of move toward uh, a different government uh, one that does represent the people and we learned that it's all about relationships there, building relationships. And I learned that early, uh, and that uh, paid off then. And when I returned to Iraq, because I had maintained many of those relationships, it, it really paid dividends uh, in the reconciliation program uh, for, for what that was worth at the, at the time. Uh, so here's what we did to dull the tip of the spear and to try to, to, uh, to, to adapt to this environment. We first partnered with the Kingdom of Jordan, their Peace Operations Training Center, and we sent all of our division uh, key leadership, key staff uh, at, at the division level and the brigade level and the battalion level through the Peace Operations Training Center in Jordan. And that happened from about October of 2003 until December of 2003. Uh, a Jordanian uh, uh, contingent there uh, gave culture training, uh, what, they, what they presented as Iraqi culture and Arab culture to all of our senior leaders uh, because General Corelli knew we need to drive that down to the lowest level of the units, which would be the squad leader level. And so we, we, we sent as many of those folks through that uh, program as we could, and, and then we brought that same team from Jordan, the Jordanians, to Fort Hood, Texas from January uh, 2004 until uh, the division started deploying in December, a piece at a time, but they stayed in uh, Fort Hood until March of 2004, continuing to train soldiers and leaders uh, in Iraqi uh, and Arab culture. We also realized we're going to be in Baghdad, and, and a lot of what we were going to do would be try to make this city services better uh, and the provincial services better for the people. So we partnered with the city of Austin, Texas, with their uh, city manager, and we had a, a week-long conference, and uh, our leaders uh, mirrored the city service department. So they would understand how a city runs its electric service, its water, its sewer, all of the infrastructure for a city, uh, the fire department, the police department. Uh, and that was uh, valuable. It also provided reach back uh, capability for the division so we could consult with the city uh, folks in Austin if we had problems about city management we needed to understand that <clears throat> and, and that was very helpful for us uh, when we got on the ground we also uh, is wanted uh, a a cultural uh, a cultural advisory team <coughs> preferably from Iraqis who also could get a security clearance at that time so that they could be sitting at the planning table when our combat operations were being planned, our security operations, and they could put a cultural filter on it before the plan was executed. Because normally what happens is you make your plan, you execute it, and then you have to go out and mitigate the damage that you've done because you realize you, 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 you did it 100% tactically correct, but 100% culturally wrong. And, uh, and it, it created problems. So, uh, so I began writing the contract for this uh, in December of 2003. We're going to sole source it with a, a, a gentleman who, who's an Egyptian, but he had a, a company. He had done a lot of work for the, for the uh, military, a, a great guy, and he recruited. We were able to get uh, one Iraqi uh, with, uh, who had a PhD in, in political science. Uh, the others were uh, as close as we could get. They, they, were, they had lived uh, or spent time uh, in Egypt. They were actually two, two, two what I call Americans, you know, non-Middle non, uh, non Eastern, uh, but they lived in Egypt for a lot of years. They really were good. They spoke the language fluently. They understood the culture. So the first team uh, that we got established this cell, but it didn't get approved until three months after we were in Iraq. But it, it proved very helpful, and it was so helpful and so valuable that uh, they continued, the divisions who kept coming in continued to renew the contract until we left in 2011. So was that effective for them? Uh, General Corelli also wanted us to, once we got to Iraq, uh, he, he required every unit to go through 40 hours of cultural training before they deployed. 
but but we also had units that joined us in Iraq. This was not a normal division. Normal division maybe has around 20,000 or so folks, uh, uh, give or take a few. By the time we were finished, there were about 60,000 soldiers under General Crowley's command just in, a, in, in Baghdad because of the nature of adapting uh, to, to the environment that we needed. Uh, so we established, uh, we found Iraqis and recruited Iraqis uh, across a spectrum of, uh, of social, cultural, political, uh, academic levels, and we, we stood up an Iraqi culture training team, Iraqis who were in Iraq under Saddam the entire time, so they could understand sort of some of those dynamics, uh, and they provided training, uh, 40 hours of training to the new units that came in, and then the general required after six months, eight hours of refresher training for every unit. So we were constantly in the mode of keeping this, uh, the cultural issues uh, in, front of, uh, in front of the people, or in front of the soldiers. Uh, and then I established, I was able to fund and establish and have my own set of advisors in these various areas, tribes, religion, uh, former regime folks that were in exile out of the country, former military also. Uh, and then we, we, we secured uh, with Baghdad University, we called technical advisory teams. Uh, so we looked at Baghdad University, uh, and if they had uh, folks who were experts in irrigation in their agricultural uh, department, then we, uh, we worked with them and, and, and contracted and called these technical advisory teams, students and professors who worked with our engineers and our, our units out of those areas to solve these uh, central service problems. These were the questions that we told every commander, every leader to ask before they uh, finalize the plan, and that is, what impact will military have, uh, operations have on the Iraqi people? Uh, look across and ask yourself that question when your plan is finished. What impact do you think this will have on them? And then ask yourself, will the, if we conduct this mission, is it going to cause more harm than good? And try to balance those interests. And then, is there a better way to achieve the same result? And this is what we kept in front of our soldiers to try to get them to think about the environment they were in, and again, as we said, dulling the tip of that spear. Now, some of these are military-type slides, okay? None of this is classified, it's, it's all been published, but uh, we, looked at, we looked at it two ways. When General Corelli said, how are we going to go into Baghdad? He looked at it from two perspectives. Do we just go in and say we're going to conduct combat operations or security operations and partner with the Iraqi security forces that we were working with? Uh, are we just going to use those two lines of operations, or are we going to do something broader? And we looked at it from the point of view that we had, you know, we had, we had no one terrorist. Remember the two percent or whatever it was. Uh, you know, they're on the last throws. Well, we, you know, they're on our slide. Uh, they they give it a five percent here, and we had folks that were on the fence. We knew that, and, but we had some that were supporting the what was going on with the coalition. And so we thought, if we just went with two lines of operations. What we're trying to do is bring those people that are on the fence to join the support. Uh, but what we thought was, if we just win hard with combat and security operations, we're going to in increase the number on the fence that go to the terrorist side, uh, or the anti-coalition force elements, as they called them. Uh, and so we didn't choose that one. The other one was called full spectrum operations, and this was General Corelli's buzzword in his term, and that was to go in, do combat operations, security operations when you need to, uh, train and employ the security forces continually, but then he added these elements that were under my uh, oversight as a civil military advisor, and that is restore and improve quality of life through essential services, promote governance, you remember we went in, uh, Professor Sharani, we were talking about this yesterday, and you know, we thought they, they should have the things that we have. So they created neighborhood councils and district councils and city councils and provincial councils and regional councils. Uh, and, uh, and so we, I mean, part of our job was to promote, promote governance. So we partnered with those councils. But particularly in the city, uh, they also had a system called the Belediat system uh, out of the Amanat, which is like the city hall of Baghdad. They provided all the municipal services. There were no district councils or neighborhood councils. And so it was also a policy decision that any projects we did in those areas had to be approved by the city council or the district council or the neighborhood council. We bypassed the Belediat who understood the infrastructure better than anyone going. And it created a lot of friction 
and caused a lot of problems. So that was a, a lesson we learned sort of the hard way. Uh, and then we, we were promoting economic pluralism. Uh, we had two big programs under us. One was called Adam Smith, which uh, we were trying to, to, to promote small business. And uh, we had business uh, incubators where we would bring people in, give them microloans. Uh, you know, they would, they would learn their trade. They would get up and running. And then they would break away, unplug from the incubator, and go out and start their business. We had an agricultural program called Amber Waves. Uh, it was pretty hard to get good fertilizer in the country because it was also an explosive, but we were able to get lots of uh, fertilizer in. Uh, new kinds of seed to enrich, you know, to, because the soil was pretty salinized and, and it, you know, from years of, uh, of uh, just uh, neglect. The irrigation system, we improved the irrigation systems and, uh, and so Baghdad started to be green again. Uh, around the edges. Uh, and so full spectrum operations, uh, we thought, was going to bring the maximum number of fence setters into the support for what was going on. Not so much support for, you know, an occupation military, uh, but support for the government, support for improving quality of life. And so this was the model that we used. This is sort of what it looked like for me. I was in the middle. Of, uh, uh, we had the GST, which was all of our subject matter experts are in the mostly in the reserve forces. You know your civil affairs uh, experts in water, sewer, electric, all the things that run a city. They're in the reserve. So all of those folks were. Uh, we came back and recruited the best of, of the the folks on tap, and they were in downtown uh, in the green zone at what we call the GST. They 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 were the daily contact with the city services people. So if something went down. Uh, you know, these were the people that helped to bring our resources. Uh, the civil affairs battalions were also, uh, we had to get them out to the units, these brigade teams and battalion teams, so they could do uh, all this improvement, all these projects, all of the, the work that we were doing at the division level, they could do it all the way out uh, to every finger, you know, as far out as we stretch. And so, in a year's time, I know, uh, I, 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 it's a conservative estimate, but about $100 million worth of projects came through my office. We approved them and, and they got implemented. Uh, some things looked pretty good when we left in 2005. <clears throat> when I went back in 2007, you wouldn't have known that anything, you know, we had done anything. It was, it was in such bad shape at that point. That's just another way to look at how, we, how my shop did uh, business. Uh, we, we said there are three things that we need to do to support the operation. One is information management, keeping track of the database uh, of everything that was going on. Key leader engagements, getting the, our key leaders involved with their key leaders. And synchronizing all the activities across the division to make sure everyone was moving in the same direction uh, for, for the division commander. And, uh, and that, uh, that was uh, sometimes a challenge. And this is what then full spectrum operations was supposed to end up with folks seeing their government as legitimate uh, and with Iraq as sort of a stable <coughs> environment, uh, you know, moving forward in their, their experiment with uh, uh, democracy. One other thing uh, I got sucked into a little bit, uh, when I first went into Iraq, I went in early before the division went and uh, got connected because a friend of mine was working with the CPA, the Coalition Provisional Authority, Office of Provincial Outreach. They had just begun reaching out to tribal leaders, religious leaders, got them connected to militia groups and insurgent groups. <clears throat> when they gave, when they returned sovereignty, the CPA went away. You know, Ambassador Bremer got on a plane and he flew and that was it. Uh, I, uh, I took that program over. And so we found ourselves talking to insurgent, Sunni insurgent groups, national resistance group leaders, um, Shia militia groups and, and their leaders, um, talking to them, trying to move them along this line of, you know, from violence to reintegration and joining the political process. Uh, in 2005, I mean, that's, I, I was extended. The first cab left in about March of 2005. I was extended because I was doing this work. Um, and there was no mechanism pretty much no mechanism in, in our in, on our side of the house on the Iraqi government side of the house uh, no one really had an appetite for this in, at that time there was too much fighting too much uh, confusion going on we did have some success there were four Sunni insurgent leaders we met with that did join the process one of them later uh, three of them went to the parliament 
uh, in, uh, in the 2005, after it, that election, one became eventually the speaker of the parliament. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, for what uh, that was worth, that worked. But I left pretty frustrated in 2005, pretty tired, pretty frustrated that there just wasn't anywhere for this to go. It, it just wasn't really going the direction we thought. Um, and so I came back, I went to the Army War College for 10 months, and then they immediately then, the first cab went back to Iraq, and they asked me to go back with them, and, and they wanted me to pick up uh, and do the same work. But they wanted me to uh, stand up the tribal program. Uh, is that 10 minutes left? Okay. Uh, they wanted me to stand up the tribal program, and, uh, and then uh, the general that I worked for at that time asked me, Will the tribe stand and fight Al-Qaeda in Baghdad like they did in Anbar a few months before? And what happened in, our, in Baghdad was when I left in 2005, the new unit that came in uh, unfortunately dismantled everything that the 1st Cavalry had been doing. Everything. And their, their thought was, we're coming, they were the unit, the 3rd Infantry Division, who, who were on the invasion. <clears throat> they said, we're coming back to finish the job we started in 2003. <laughs> With, without recognizing that it, it wasn't the same place, it wasn't the same dynamic. They disengaged from all the tentacles we had, you know, with the different groups and people. They stopped doing any projects. They pulled back to their military base, and Baghdad erupted in sectarian conflict. Uh, and Al-Qaeda took over whole sections of the west and the south and parts of the north of Baghdad. The Shia militias were on the east side and the south. And, so really what you had were those two forces and the U.S. was just sort of sitting in the middle of it, watching it happen. So they asked me if the tribes would fight Al-Qaeda and I said, well, I'll have to meet with the tribal leaders uh, and, and, uh, and ask them uh, and, uh, you know, and, and let you know. Uh, so I had a series of meetings uh, for about um, 30 days. I met with several tribal leaders and uh, they came back uh, uh, they came back and said, we have a question for your generals. Will they support us if we stand and fight Al-Qaeda? Will they support us and will they protect us, not just against Al-Qaeda, but against the Shia militias that are coming into uh, raiding our neighborhood and against the sectarian government? Will they, will they protect us? And so the general said, tell them yes. And so I told them yes. And so uh, they, uh, they said, okay, here's what we'll do. We, we, will, we will use our forces to block the north entrance, the west entrance, and the south entrance to Baghdad. And we won't let anyone in, and we will use our folks inside the city with you all, and with the Iraqi security forces, we'll squeeze the inside of Baghdad like a sponge, like a wet sponge, and you will pick up any, any of them coming out, and we will clear, we will help you clear, uh, clear the city. And that was my first briefing slide to our generals, very crude but very simple slide. And that's exactly what happened. And so we began recruiting, uh, we began connecting our commanders with tribal leaders and folks in the areas, and Kurt Pinkerton was a lieutenant colonel at that time, out in Abu Ghraib in the west uh, side between Fallujah and Baghdad, a very hot zone. Uh, he was there as an economy of force, just a small battalion. <clears throat> we connected him with some of the leaders who would later uh, be some of the, the head uh, tribal awakening leaders. And he was talking to them one day, and he said, "Well, you can you give me some fighters?" And he, and he, the person he was talking to, the tribal leader, said, "Sure. How many do you want?" And he said, "Well, as many as you can get." And he said, "Okay, I, I've got them." And he said, "Well, where?" And he said, "Well, follow me." So he walked out the back of his uh, tribal headquarters, and this is the picture that Kurt Pinkerton saw. And he said, "I've got to take a picture of this. This is unbelievable." And he took a picture, and, and that that was that was what saved Abu Ghraib. And so from in, in less than six months, in, in February or March of 2004 to December roughly, we went from zero tribal fighters to 60,000 just in Baghdad. Just in Baghdad. And you might know that made Prime Minister Maliki a little nervous, uh, having you know, 60,000 mostly Sunni uh, armed fighters, more than his security forces in Baghdad. <clears throat> but what happened was, they weren't all Sunni by the way, but a majority were. Uh, we, we went from about six, almost 6,000 attacks a day all over the country. It started going down, the number of attacks. When, when the Sahua tribal awakening folks started going up and we surged our forces, started going up, the attacks started going down. 
And we also saw the lethality of the attacks. You know, some of those car bombs used to kill two and three hundred people, kill or wound two and three hundred people. Uh, I, you'd be sitting out at the airport at our base, a car bomb could go off ten miles away and it would shake everything. It was that powerful. Uh, so what we knew was we were disrupting Al-Qaeda support cells. They couldn't get the support, they couldn't get the logistics in to build the huge car bombs, and they were on the run. And the reason they were is, you know, our strategy was to use intelligence and then, you know, go in and grab the leader, you know, when we would find him. But what happens in a good cellular organization when you take the leader out? They just replace him. You know, they have another leader, they protect the other cells. But these tribal fighters knew where Al-Qaeda whole cells were. And they would go in and dis, you know, uproot those whole cells and they would get on the run. Uh, and, uh, and so we were able to take back Baghdad. Uh, and, and the tribal program, the, what became called the Sons of Iraq, became the lead edge of the reconciliation program. How well the Iraqi government who promised to give them jobs and reintegrate them into society after it was all done, how well they did that. And it was a pretty much a failure as well. Uh, these are quick slides. You know, we didn't just stand up these fighters without any thought. <clears throat> our JAG, our lawyers, went through a whole process of, okay, what can we legally do? And we weren't even going to fund them in the beginning. Our plan was for them to serve under the district police chiefs, uh, for work for the Iraqis, and let them be like auxiliary police, because that way they're working for the government and working with the government. Uh, but uh, that got scrapped, and so we said, what do we do with them? We got 60,000 fighters. So we entered contracts, uh, what we call critical infrastructure security contracts, and that's what they did. Uh, and they helped, frankly, take back Baghdad. But there was a lot of friction between them getting credit for it and the Iraqi security forces. There was a lot of friction uh, that uh, took a lot of time uh, to garner. These are some of the folks that were out in the area. Every one of them were either have been attacked or had assassination attempts or have been killed uh, in, the, in, the, in that time and, and it continues to happen uh, even now, the retaliation for the, what they did to help with that program. Uh, so the reconciliation project was, uh, the, the Prime Minister Maliki started a reconciliation committee when he took office in late 2006, early 2007, because there was so much violence going on uh, General Petraeus came on board at that time and Ambassador Crocker and they said, you know, we need something in our organization to try to help the Iraqi government with, you know, the mirrors and helps them with this process. So <clears throat> from the General Petraeus level all the way down to the brigade level, <clears throat> we had reconciliation cells or sections and our job was to, uh, to mirror what the, the, the liaison with them uh, in the Iraqi government and work with them. Uh, in what we call reconciliation. Uh, IFCNR was the acronym, the Implementation and Follow-up Committee for National Reconciliation uh, was the committee. Uh, it also worked with the Iraqi National Security Agency, the DDR committee, disarm, demobilize, reintegrate militias. All that money funneled through there to try to uh, <coughs> stabilize Iraq and try to then give it time to enter political reconciliation. Uh, it turned out it just was a move to disarm Sunni militias, not Shia militias, and uh, of course political reconciliation didn't really take place. Uh, and then we transitioned everything. As I was leaving in 2011, I started a year and a half before trying to get the embassy connected with all that network. Uh, and even today, they still call saying, are you still in touch? You know, they just, you know, people rotate out and they just don't maintain contact. But what I learned was, you need to make, you don't want to wait until you need something to build the relationship. You build the relationship first, and then it's natural to, to ask. Being a soldier isn't about shooting accurately anymore, or how fast you can run, or how high you can climb, or how much you can jump out of airplanes. It's how much information you can get on a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> uh, and, uh, that's sort of the new norm. And so we had a general that said, hey, I want all that on one slide. So this is the product. This is our reconciliation strategy. If you can figure it out. Uh, this is probably why Iraq is the way it is today. <laughs> uh, but what we said was really, it's a bottom-up driven process. The people are down here. They're nested in tribes, you know, religion, culture, all those things wrapping the people. But these things in sort of a purple here are all the issues that the people deal with every day. So it's bottom-up pressure, putting pressure on the government uh, 
And then what we needed was top-down refinement. You know, we were helping to be a catalyst for getting these issues up to the government through the provincial government and the national government. And then we needed their top-down effort to sort of, you know, reach down and help resolve these issues. And, uh, and, and we spent all of our time doing that, the reconciliation task, as we call them, are here. And then the venues were all these places over here where we tried to encourage them to meet together. Uh, you know, tribal leaders, religious leaders, government leaders, people from all walks have, have meetings. Uh, uh, I have a slide here. What we call reconciliation events, where they all come together, they sort of share what's going on and have you know, dialogue with what's going on, promise to <coughs> fix it. And, and, uh, and so we were there fostering that. We weren't forcing it, we were trying to foster it uh, and, and nudge it along a little bit. Uh, for that to happen. Uh, this is sort of how we looked at, at getting the reconcilables and, the, and knowing who was reconcilable and who wasn't. So we used the tribal leaders who knew their tribes the best and, and the different groups and said, tell us, you know, you need to find out all the people that are more in the green. And then the tribe leaders said, what we'll do is the folks on the edge, it'll be like an infection. We'll cut them off. We'll excise them. They're, they're not reconcilable. And that's one of the benefits of using those groups, is they understood the people that were with them. Um, this was the reconciliation model. We had no strategy. There was no frag and no order that said, here's our policy. Or, so we sort of had to do it on our own. And we found these two elements of reconciliation through some readings of uh, attribution down here. Uh, one was signaling, and that was the, where the government sort of acts against its own interest and tries to send a signal to the disaffected population that they're serious about doing this, you know, to build trust. And so that's why we hosted those reconciliation events. And then the forgiveness model is more like what the tribes do to stop blood feuds and their fossil, their tribal fossil. You know, they try to stop uh, the blood feud. Uh, and that's the policy we followed. This was, a, this was the director, uh, you might know him, Safafa Sheikh. Uh, uh, he was the director of the national, deputy director of national security, head of the first head of the Prime Minister's Reconciliation Committee in a neighborhood called Jihad uh, in southwest Baghdad. It was split, Sunni Shia, there was a lot of ethnic violence there, and uh, in 2007 they were able to bring them together. They all signed this uh, pact, uh, Reconciliation Pact. It is held up until today, but it's being very strained right now because of what's going on in Iraq. That's a tribal fossil. I, I, I was invited, attended quite a few. It's something to behold if you've never been to one. It's sort of like a trial, but with a lot of theatrics. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's a, a process to stop the blood feuds and, uh, you know, to get the, it's more about communal harmony than individual responsibility. So they want to restore the harmony of the community, and we try to encourage this in our reconciliation program. We try to encourage that kind of thinking to go up into the government, political parties and into the government, uh, and uh, wasn't extremely successful. Those are reasons why we reached out to tribes. We weren't trying to tribalize Iraq. We were trying to use that network, you know, to reach every part of Iraq as we could, but we always tried to integrate it into its government uh, uh, processes. And we, religious leaders, we were connected to all the key leaders, either directly or indirectly. I call this the class of 98. What time, time is it? Drew, I know I'm out of time, but I don't care. Thank you. Okay. This was, real quick, the class of 98, I call it. That's a picture that one of my advisors found from the Hausa down in Najaf, you know, the, the clerical academy in Najaf. Uh, and these folks, uh, this is half of it. I cut half the picture off because they, they weren't, they didn't rise to the level of this class. Uh, they studied under Muqtada Sadr's father. And of course, Muqtada Sadr is here. Uh, but I call them the class of 98 because, you know, you've got Muqtada Sadr and Salah Obeidi and, you know, all this core right here formed Jaysh al-Mahdi, you know, the first militia that we faced uh, in uh, the fighting uh, in, in Iraq. Uh, and then, uh, and then you had Kais Kazali and uh, Akram al-Kabi and Muhammad Tabatabai they broke away and formed a Saab al haq you know, a, a, a very, a very well-organized militia that was trained, funded, equipped by Iran. Uh, and we had, uh, we captured uh, Case, uh, Case and his brother in 2008, I think it was, in Basra, the airport. 
Uh, and uh, I visited him quite a bit, and he told me that, you know, he went to the housing not to be a religious leader, but he went as sort of a college deferment, you know, so he didn't have to go into Saddam's army. And, uh, and he was very clear about that. But he, he is the leader of Asad al Haq, and, and they gained quite a bit of political traction when Prime Minister Maliki forced us to sort of reconciliation, release them all from prison, but they became his militia. He did not really have a militia, and he sort of partnered with them loosely. Uh, so that's why I call these guys the class of 98. Uh, all of them are militia leaders, uh, and besides uh, the cleric. Uh, this gentleman right here, Dr. Uh, Khaled, uh, he, he was a very good man. Uh, he, he was very educated. He worked to try to educate the population. You know, he, he had a program he was putting in schools and things to try to get them away from this, you know, extremist mentality. Uh, and he traveled in other countries in the Middle East. I had just gotten him connected to the U.S. Embassy. They were interested in funding, helping fund, uh, you know, a project for him uh, during Ramadan of 2011. And it, the meeting was on a Monday. On Friday, he was at the mosque for his Friday prayers, and a suicide vest bomber got in uh, and killed him. So the very thing he was fighting against is what got him in, in, in the end. This is one, la and I'll end here. This is a, a, a story. I, this young man was a, a tribal awakening fighter, and I met him in the hospital. We had been seen a hospital in the green zone when I was visiting another young man there. And then I got to know his father, Sheikh Kadir, right here. They lived down in a section of Baghdad called Arab Jabur, which was a hotbed, uh, Al-Qaeda nest from the their very beginning. And they joined the tribal awakening, and, and they and the others there were able to get rid of Al-Qaeda. But when I went, he wanted me, I met him in the hospital, and I got to know him, and he wanted me to come visit him when his son got out of the hospital, so, so I did. Uh, and when I went to the house, there were all these kids, there were like 19 kids running around. There weren't many houses around, I thought they were neighbor kids. But they were kids from his cousin and his uncle, uh, where Al-Qaeda had killed the uncle, you know, the men, and then raped the women and, you know, cut their heads off. So he, they were raising these kids in this little farmhouse. Uh, and this lady, Um Ali, we called her, little skinny lady, you know, she was the mother there, and, and she was taking care of them. And, uh, and, uh, and so we had a good time here. And about a year later, uh, his son got arrested because some Shia militias, you know, informed on him and made up a case about him, and they arrested him. Uh, he was in jail for several months. We were able to get him released. The night he came home, they were having a celebration out in the yard. The, his father, him, his uncle, another uncle and cousins were out there. And some, we still don't know who it was, they were dressed in security uniforms, came and killed them all. <laughs> and so now it was just left with this, this lady and all those kids. So. These are the struggles, you know, that uh, these folks went through. And he wasn't even getting paid, frankly, you know, for what he was doing, you know, to try to clear his neighborhood. Uh, but the price everyone pays. Uh, and then again, it was all about relationship. This was one of my advisors. He, he was shot three times. His house was bombed twice. Uh, and I, I was in the green zone once. He lived in Mansoor area. His house was bombed. He called me, said he'd just been bombed. I said, are there any military units there? And he said, no. So I took my PSD. We sort of cordoned off the area. When I went in the house, I asked him how his wife was, Um Ziyad. And he said she, you know, the glass you know, had cut her, her and she was bleeding. So I went in, took a combat medic kit in with me. She was sitting on the sofa. And the first thing she did, and she had, you know, blood coming, you know, she got up and said, oh, Colonel, I've got to get you a Pepsi. And she, she ran, I said, no, sit down, sit down. I mean, it was a hot day, you know how hot it is, the uh, pastor there. And I had my gear on, you know. And she would not rest until she went out in her kitchen and got me a cold Pepsi. And this is the generosity and the hospitality of Iraqi people. You know, they think about, I mean, I said they, you can't outgive Iraqis, frankly. They can be your worst enemy if, you know, your fiercest enemy. But they, they can be your best friends. And, and that was my experience, and, and I wouldn't trade it uh, for the world. And I hope, you know, there are a lot of issues that we learned and a lot of problems uh, that were predicted out of the work we did. Uh, it just seemed like no one listened. <laughs> we didn't change. So thank you, and I hope that made sense.
for your presentation. Very interesting. Obviously, you are a very intelligent, informed, and conscientious young man. Um, I have a simple question. What the hell went wrong? <laughs> well, I, an overview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, I mean, several things, but if I was looking at the big things, the first thing is we didn't have a clear picture of what Iraq was really like. You know, Saddam sort of kept the lid, as I call it, on the jar. We didn't know what was in the jar. And we didn't know what was going to happen when the lid came off. Uh, and so we make, I said, when you make a military plan, you always use facts. If you have the facts, you base your plan on actual facts. If you don't know a fact, but it's, a, it's, it's essential to your plan, you have to make an assumption. So you have to base your assumption on the best information you have, and then you, you, make, you go ahead and make your plan. When you hit the ground, then you're, you're looking to see if those facts were right and if those assumptions were correct. And if the assumptions were not correct, you're supposed to change them and then adapt your plan you know, with the actual facts on the ground. We did not do that, at least we did not do that quickly. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm convinced we didn't do it very much at all. We simply went in uh, with this idea. We never were able to change our organization to, to fit what was really going on. Does that, does that boil down to a, a uh, um, fundamental ignorance, obviously, uh, and a strategic failure? Yeah, definitely a strategic failure. And I think it was more arrogance than ignorance. Uh, there was a fight between the State Department and the Defense Department. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld was sort of taking control of everything. He thought that he thought, I mean, he, you know, frankly, we reported to him we destroyed half of Saddam's army in the first Gulf War and, uh, and that they, he never reconstituted it. So he was questioning, well, why do you need the same number of soldiers, you know, in, in your battle plan for this war that you had in the last war if you destroyed half his army? So he thought we could go in lighter and faster. He just didn't think about how we needed to secure the country. And then the debathification orders were huge mistakes. Uh, they went, you know, went too deep, uh, and that sort of made a failing state, in my opinion, totally <coughs> fail. I mean, Ambassador can speak to that more than I can, but th those are sort of my views of it, e even at that time. Strategic failure at the highest level. Oh yeah, I think so. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, so, point came up the um, the uh, many of the insurgents were funded by Iran. Uh, what was the most difficult part to reduce Iranian influence in Iraq? It's still, I mean, today it's even a huge problem. But yeah. So what were, I'm yeah. sure that you were trying to reduce the influence, but why wasn't it possible to reduce it more? Yeah, now when I, when I use the term, I use insurgents, I, I sort of classify those Sunni and militias as Shia. That's just how I do it. I'm talking the same thing. Uh, we had every... Uh, Starting in two, when General Petraeus came aboard, let's jump ahead there first. I mean, we knew Iran sort of came in the country right after us and sometime before us and started filling up the South and moving up. But we had every third Wednesday, we had a special video teleconference, and one was on reducing Iranian, malign Iranian in interference. Uh, it was a lot of talk, and there just wasn't a lot we could do because by that time, politically, our hands had been tied because if we if we would conduct raids, for instance, on those Shia militias that were funded by Iran, somebody in the government would complain and we would have to shut them down. And so we, we could not effectively do it. And I'll give you an example. We arrested what we called the Erbil Five in 2008, I think it was, or seven up in Erbil. They were really a special forces team, half a team. <laughs> and we had them in prison until 2009. And then they negotiated through Prime Minister Maliki for us to release them. We were going to release them transfer them to Prime Minister Maliki's custody. Uh, I happened to be given the task to, to give a message to them uh, from our commanding uh, generals, uh, General Odierno at that time. So we got a Farsi speaker, and uh, they pulled into the cross sabers, you know, where I had the picture of where we were. They pulled the, hum, or the MRAPs, the big vehicles in there. We had them in the back of an MRAP. And I, was give, I, I gave them this message that said, look, Stop interfering in your neighbors. Stop, basically, this. stop interfering in Iraq's political uh, affairs. 
stop interfering in their country, go home and don't come back or we're going to arrest you. It's sort of a message really like that. And I thought, this is totally ridiculous. But I gave the message just like I was ordered to. And those guys just looked at me, you know? I mean, they just looked at me like, <laughs> I know what they were thinking. Okay, you've got like 100,000 troops in this country. You invaded this country, you took out their government, and you're telling us, five of us, to go home? Uh, you know, it was just that silly. You know, so our effort was not really very robust. You know, we knew what was going on. We just didn't really do anything about it. Really pretty bad. Any other questions? Sorry. Professor? Thank you um, for excellent presentation. I was looking for something that I'm calling political theology of American empire of trust. And I think you have given me the elements of what that theology, political theology of this empire of trust is all about. And is its intent really to solve problems or is it just simply to episodically manage problems? Uh, you know, my feeling was when President Bush, you know, sent us in there, I think he idealistically thought that, you know, really maybe thought that things could be, could, could change. But uh, it became apparent at some point that, uh, and I'm just telling you my experience, that at some point early in my first tour, the committee to reelect President Bush took over running the war. So everything had to sort of look like the appearance of success at the at the you know expense of actually building foundations for success, so we saw that happening, and, and and we didn't really improve anything. And then later, it was more about managing. And I know from talking to the highest level people there at the time that by 2010, they were told just get a government <coughs> formed, and in 2011 we were told get out of there before it sort of erupts. So we were just in the management mode at that time. Um, so it's all, about I'm sorry. It's, okay. it's all about relationships. I think so. I do too. Um, and you've got to have a relationship before you go ask for something. And the relationships don't really mean anything until you've been at it for seven years. Um, and it's only then that you can actually understand and maybe have some influence. But the U.S. Armed Forces, the U.S. State Department, the U.N., the EU, they're all organized around a radically different principle, which is you parachute in three days after the problem has occurred, and then you try and do something about it. Except special forces. Except way before. Yeah. Um, and, and in part, that is the question that I want to ask. Is like to say, um, is this inevitable in large organizations of this sort? Is, is the bureaucratic logic such that we're never going to be able to look for the U.S. government or the U.N. or the EU to actually maintain long-standing relationships everywhere in the world where there might be trouble, so as to be in a position to help. And, and let me just offer a particular anecdote here. Um, the UN once approached the CCD about becoming a UN umbrella organization, and the idea was that we would be their constitutional commandos. That's the phrase they used, which is a phrase that, of course, really turned me on. But what I realized was what they meant was we would parachute in three days after, the think that we're talking about Canada. Can you go in and try and mediate these things? And what I found myself saying was, we don't know anybody in Canada. How can I possibly help in Canada? Because I don't know anybody in Canada. But it was clear that that was not something the UN thought was particularly important. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, but after that, it's not only you tell it, uh, parachute in three days after the problem, it's your helicopter out, you know, two months, six months later. I mean, it's or a week later after you left right. Exactly. Right. Right. I was going to say, I, one of the meetings I had with insurgent leaders in 2005, uh, they were sitting there and, and I was trying to explain to them all the good things we wanted to do for Iraq. And, and one of them looked and just now said, you know, Colonel Welch, we've read your history, you know, American history. We've read your history and we know that you're politically divided. We know that you'll take a few casualties and pretty soon there's going to be people screaming for you to come home. And we know, you know, they said if that's one year, two years, five years, doesn't matter, it's going to be short, and you're going to be out of here. And if you read our history, we will fight for as long as it takes to drive out any occupation force. And so staying power, I think, is, you know, the decision to go in is one thing. The de how long you stay is another one, you know, and, and how you leave it. Because I don't think we, I mean, you know, there's a debate in Vietnam about this too, but, you know, did we stay long enough 
and do the right things. I said, uh, toward the, the end, when we were trying to keep the force there, you know, uh, and uh, I said, look, if all we're going to do is the same thing we're doing, then no one wants us to stay here and just watch bad things happen to good people. We're not doing anything. We're just staying here. We're watching, and we're not influencing the action whatsoever toward the end. And, and so I, I think I think we just, we're not, I, I don't know, the organization just can't do it unless they're committed. Somehow you have a bridge that he, if you really do feel like what you've done is the right or you need to stay, something that keeps you beyond these political earlier cycles. You know, I, I don't know. And, and, and not just long-term U.S. But long tours of duty for individual officers. Well, I proposed this in one of my papers is, you know, uh, is the thing that benefited me was I stayed longer, not because I volunteered. I mean, it just happened to be that way, but that really made a difference. So, and, and we kept changing patches. You know how the Army is, you know, everybody wants their patch, like Boy Scouts, you know, you got your patch. Well, you know, I said, let's just have, you know, we had a patch for multinational division Baghdad that, you know, sort of had an Iraqi flavor to it in the court. Just have soldiers wear that so people don't see them changing every year. You know, they're changing. And, and, and the people, the Iraqis started saying, okay, we've got to train a new group. And, you know, we have a new group in, we have to train them. And, and they'll repeat the same mistakes. And they did. Yes, Bob, to the State Department served for three years. So just about the time we're starting to learn a little bit about the country and bring it to another country. Also, I think uh, saying it's all about relationship really doesn't tell us much because relationship involves someone else. But who are those partners? Always thugs. And so what, what is a relationship with a thug in, in come any I mean outcome anyway in these contexts? Well uh well, we haven't been blessed by the rule of angels in the Middle East. Maybe I'll find the stuff different. <laughs> but in the Middle East, we have not been blessed with it. And I've shaken the hands of some of those thugs and had to wash my hands afterwards. But that's the political class that in some cases pre-exists and in other cases gets empowered after intervention. You don't have that option. This is who it is. I, I don't buy that we don't have any option. I think we can empower anybody if we wish to do so. And we could get rid of the thugs and replace them by decent we people. Did, did but I don't think that has been the case or the intention. Dr. Nazif, we didn't empower Muqtada Sadr. Muqtada Sadr has a following in Sadr City, two million people in Baghdad. I don't say they all follow him, but he has a substantial following. He's one of the thugs. Uh, Asa'ib Ansar al-Haq you talked about. I mean, these are pre-existing thugs who have real followers, who really matter. Who are who? Who are? Uh, you know, uh, nobody thinks Jalal Talabani and Masoud Barzani are choir boys, but they have real followers. It, it, I mean, they they have real followers because they have the means to appease those who are after them. And if you provide the alternative person who is not like them and cares about decency of you know their community and helping them and so forth. You can create a parallel power structure, and you can. Again, it's relationship that Dr. Williams says. It's not a momentary thing. It's a long-term thing. And if you are willing to support an alternative leadership uh, in, a, in any environment, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan, I think you can, you can build an alternative power structure that is decent and that can, in fact, do a different, uh, I mean, help bring about a different kind of outcome than the ones we have uh, seen in these places. Um, and as if I, I do, I do appreciate your goodwill. I do understand what you're saying. May I give a totally different example from Turkey, where today's dictator was actually supported both by United States and then by Europe and brought to power. The man is a full-fledged dictator at this point in time. But he's also been elected by the people. I mean, you have to deal with Erdogan. This is Erdogan's Turkey right now. It, whether he's supported by foreign leaders or not, foreign powers or not, he has a following in the country. He hasn't lost an election. If, if I could explain what I mean by relationship with, I, I meant, uh, we knew there were lots of different kinds of people. Uh, General Pirelli, for instance, told me, go turn over every rock, you find it, whatever you can find, and we'll, we'll find out who it is, and we'll decide 
what kind of relationship we need to build you know, with that person. So I'm talking relationships of trust, uh, even with insurgent folks that we talked about, they need to know that we're communicating in an open, as open way as we can, and that I'm not going to have them arrested you know, after a meeting, uh, that kind of thing, so relationships of trust. I learned that there's three levels of friendship there. Your friend, the guy you grew up, you know, the person you grew up with, then there's the friend of my friend, so you know, if someone introduces me to you and we're a common friend, I don't have to build the relationship. It's sort of there because of our common friend. And then there's the enemy of my enemy, which is the loosest of friendships, it's an alliance. So there's lots of different kinds of relationships that we, we just had to learn how to manage them. And uh, as the ambassador says, you know, you, you kind of go with the cards that are there on the table, but you have to know. You know, as I told you, I mean, I had a relationship with now the president of Egypt, you know, okay. where we were co classmates at the war college. But we were sort of friends, but, you know, he's in a different role now. I have no idea how that would play out. So you never know where people are going to end up. Yeah, president of Afghanistan is also a friend of mine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't make any darn difference. <laughs> <laughs> I think we said we would thank rather you. stay on time, okay. so thank you very much. <laughs> For those who'd like to eat more, please, there's more food. <laughs>